Hello my friends and welcome back. It's a new week, it's a new day, it's Monday, so let the surviving game begin. You and me, we are going to survive the hell out of this week, I promise you that. And when it's Friday, you're gonna feel good about yourself. We'll immediately jump into the biggest news about Russia-Ukrainian war, and it's not about Russia and not about Ukraine, because it's about China. China is in this war, they're trying to hide it, Russia is trying to hide it, China is afraid of the Western sanctions because they get a majority of their money from the western markets still so they do have an, a very big interest that Russia wouldn't fall to the West, so they have every interest to keep up this conflict, but they don't want to fall under the Western sanctions. How is China benefiting Russia in the war? China provides Russia with satellite imagery for military purposes, equaling China tells Russia where exactly do microelectronics and machine tools for tanks, optics, propellants to be used in missiles, and huge amount of funding without which Russian economy would be already collapsing. For example, Russia doesn't have anywhere to sell their oil and gas except for China and India. And India recently has been buying less and less of it, although they went to all-time highs, now they're pulling back. And China is buying Russian oil with an incredibly low price. We're hearing about 30 to $35 per barrel, which is almost the price which Russia gets it out of the ground with. I think Russian own price or spending to get a barrel of oil out of the ground is about 25 to 30, so they're making almost no profit. They're selling that oil to China with such a discount because China is aiding Russia in the war and aiding their economy and also building out some of the infrastructure in Russia. Therefore, Russia cannot pay them back with gold or dollars. They're paying them back with extremely cheap oil. What this tells us is that China is in this war. The new Axis powers, the central central pillars of those Axis powers are Russia and China. And then the outsourcing, outfacing pillars are North Korea, Iran, Syria, Belarus. We have the new Axis powers versus the allies. Talking about the evolvement of this war into something bigger, a world war perhaps? European Union leaders still like to play that this war doesn't really concern them this much. Well, my friends, I'm here to tell that Russia has been attacking European Union plane, drain infrastructure, logistics networks, and airplane services with the Kaliningrad GPS jamming. I'll read you a report. Czech Transport Minister Martin Kupka stressed in the Financial Times that Russia has made thousands of attempts to disrupt the operation of EU rail networks and sabotage critical infrastructure. Sabotaging or destroying any country's rail network direct, directly takes away from their GDP from the country because rail is where money is generated, where goods move around, logistics is money. If you sabotage it, you hurt the country financially. And this is what Russia is doing in the EU. Yes, we don't have Russian tanks on the streets, but they are fighting us with everything they can without the tanks. And the EU leaders sometimes would like to ignore this. We are at war with Russia, but it's not a hot war right now. It's a cold war. We cannot play anymore that it's not war. We have to act like it is so we can defend ourselves properly. These attempts to undermine Europe's railways have particularly increased following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, with hackers targeting signaling and ticketing systems. For example, pro-Russian hackers attacked the signaling system of the Czech railway operator Keske Trahu, <laughs> posing significant risk of accidents. Same as happened also in Estonia, by the way. We have Russian information attacks that directly hurt the country, hurt people commuting the work, hurt the country's financial situation through that. So Russia has a way to hurt European Union financially, also not with oil and tanks or gas, but with attacks against the logistics. What is European Union doing against this? I will leave that for you to answer. My friends, look at this. We are at 56% combined arms birthday party fundraiser, which I launched on last Friday, 66,000 out of 120,000. With one video, you guys carried almost half of this fundraiser. Now let's take it home, my friends. Let's give Ukrainian units some new Estonian-made drones. Yes, you heard correctly, Estonian-made. 
speed and also raid trucks. Link is in the description below. Go and watch now the fundraiser video. Cue it now. Hello my friends and for the first time I'm not making a fundraiser video for you from Ukraine but from Estonia, my home country. I am in front of Kraftworks, an Estonian drone company and they have produced something extremely beautiful for us. What is this? This is not a DJI drone, it is not a Chinese made drone, it is an Estonian made drone with Estonian technology. It's a thermal drone with a range of 20 kilometers. It's a recon drone. It's everything that right now is done in Ukraine by Chinese drones and that is bad because Russia and China they do exchange intelligence. This is our weapon against that alliance. This is the West versus the new Axis which is Russia and China. And my friends I will call upon you to donate on this new campaign which is called the Combined Arms Birthday Party because my birthday party is coming up on 24th of April. Buy five of these new drones. We will send them to Ukrainian elite forces, elite drone operators. They will test them out. And this will be the main alternative to the DJI, a non-Chinese, an Estonian product, safe NATO product for Ukrainian troops to use their recon abilities on. This drone will guide FPV drones to Russian positions and Russian tanks, and it will save lives directly. Donation link is in the description below. Through donating, you will help to liberate Ukrainian territory one destroy Russian tank at a time. Let's do it, my friends, like you have done it many times before. Slava Ukraini! Cue the Napoleonic Paddle March! Da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da. Da, da, da. We have a new Napoleon in France and he's called Macron, like the little sweet burger. Macron Napoleon, because he has balls suddenly. I don't know where he got it from, but he has them. And this is what we need right now in Europe. We need leaders who are not afraid of their own shadow, who are not afraid of war, and who are not afraid to take up arms to defend our economic and democratic zone of the European Union. And Macron right now is one of them. Scholz demanded from Macron not to help Ukraine with the French army because a world war is likely. The French president responded by saying that he did not want to be a coward and his decision did not need the consensus of NATO or the EU. France is making history. If French president would be doing that if there were no war on the outskirts of the European Union, then this would be looked very badly upon. But right now we need this kind of behavior. We need strength. We need uh, strong leaders who are not backing down at the first backlash. And right now Macron, surprisingly to me, is proving to be one. I'm very surprised. Estonia also has one in the Prime Minister, Kaya Kallas. She is a woman, but she has more balls than all the other Estonian ministers combined. I'm very proud to have such a great Prime Minister. Also, as a European, I'm proud that we have Macron right now. How do you know that Macron, Emmanuel Macron, is doing something right with his, let's call it posturing? Oh, we will send troops into Ukraine. French troops will be in Ukraine. We don't care what the United States says. We don't care what Germany says. And we don't care what Russia says. You know why? We know that this actually has gotten through to the Russians. Because for the first time in 22 months, Shoigu, the defense minister of Russia, called the defense minister of France. Why would he do that? They're at total war with Ukraine and according to Russia's own propaganda, at total war with the West. Why would he call? Because they have so much to lose when Western powers actually get involved. Because Russians know, the Russian leadership knows, that yes, they can fight their war in Ukraine, but when actual Western troops are on the ground, there is no comparison. Russia will be pummeled to the ground. Now we have an understanding of an unusual telephone call from the Russian war minister to the French defense minister. The first call in over 22 months. Shoigu was on the phone for a reason. He wanted to make it clear that French troops in Ukraine in any capacity would make things very difficult for France. Anyone would think that President Macron didn't know that. But what the call really shows is that the idea that France or po but what the call really shows is that the idea that France or Poland or anyone else putting troops of any kind into Ukraine for any reason is a situation Russia wants to avoid. Well, of course they do. <laughs> they know how bad they are at war compared to the West. I mean, this statistic says it all. NATO has sent 
for from their overall entire military capability combined less than 10%. I think it was even less than 5% of entire NATO military capacity to Ukraine. So it's just a little teeny tiny bit and Russia therefore has had to allocate third, one third of the entire country's capability to military procurement to keep up with it. So if NATO actually gets involved, any gears up the military production, Russia is done for. They know that. So they don't want French troops in Ukraine. <clears throat> it would complicate their situation dramatically. And that's the point. It seems clear that despite the propaganda, Russia knows any confrontation on land with another Western ally, especially a nuclear armed one like France. Oh, French is the nuclear power. Russian nuclear posturing out of the window, guys. Now you have another nuclear power against you on the ground, they can also push the button. And look at French nuclear talk. I think the French, if I don't mistake here, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they, their nuclear doctrine is different from the United States, Britain and, and Russia. They have something called the preemptive strike. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but I fr think French is the only country in the world which has a preemptive strike in their nuclear doctrine. What? Crazy. If I was Putin, I'd be needing uh, to change my diapers right now. Clearly the idea of the... <sighs> Clearly, the idea of their war in Ukraine taking a turn like this is deeply disturbing for Russia. And that the entire point of President Macron's strategy of not setting red lines, Russia can see difficult sentences I cannot understand. Let's now, my friends, it's time to give credit where credit is due. And this goes back to 2014 also, because we're talking about the Netherlands. They have come out with the information that all together they will give 24 F-16s and they will be handed over to Ukraine as soon as everything is ready. This moment depends on the training of the Ukrainian pilots and technicians as well as infrastructure. The Netherlands has a beef with Russia definitely because their plane was shot down. Their civilians perished through the hands of Igor Kirkin who through the irony of the history is now in Russian prison. Formerly Russian hero now a Russian prisoner. How fast things change but the Netherlands the Dutch they have not forgotten. Because he shot down the wrong plane, Igor Kirkin, I mean. Now Ukraine is re receiving 24 F-16s. You pushed the wrong button, Mr. Kirk. Ukraine will have modern Western jets. Yes, I do call knowingly. F-16 is a modern Western jet. This is what Igor Kirkin did with his shenanigans with the air defense. Thank you, Netherlands. Thank you, Dutch people, for overdoing yourself with this. They're leading. Like the Czech is leading with ammunition to Ukraine right now, the Netherlands is leading with the jet supply. They will be the first country to do so. There are many countries involved, of course, but they are the ones I think about if I think about F-16 for Ukraine. Thank you, Dutch people. My friends, now we jump to Russia, and this is troubling, but this is far from being an isolated event. You remember in 2024, this year in January, there was extremely cold, and then the water pipes started bursting in Russia, resulting in a humanitarian catastrophe in many Russian cities, and then they were saved by, not by their good mechanics or technicians, but by weather going warmer. They were not saved. It was just postponed. It will happen again next year. Why? Because every pipe you install on the ground has a lifespan. In the Soviet Union, they installed most of the piping in Russia in the 50s and 60s. That lifespan is about 50 years. And after that, they will burst. In the span of like five, six years, they will burst. That 50 years is over. Putin has been knowing this. For 20 years, he has been leading the country when these pipes would start bursting. And he has done nothing. He has not poured any money into this infrastructure. And now they start bursting and people are without hot water in the winter. Why I'm talking about this is Putin decides to pour billions of USD in destroying Ukraine while Russian-owned infrastructure is crumbling. Everything you build as an infrastructure project has lifespan and has maintenance interval. Even big dams and pipes. And I talk about dams because in Orsk, a dam broke. It was not sabotage, it was just an infrastructure 
infrastructure not maintained, not fixed, not repaired, and it broke. Who could have foreseen it? Well, everybody, actually, because this is what you need to do to maintain infrastructure. About 190,000 people are at the risk of flooding. About 4,000 people have been evacuated, and 2,500 buildings are underwater. This is not connected to Ukraine. It is connected to Putin not deliberately fixing Russian infrastructure. He has the money. He has the manpower. He would have everything to do so except for the political will and interest because he doesn't care about his own people. If you even take away half of the money allocated to the war and destruction in Ukraine and allocate that to building hospitals, schools, fixing dams, fixing, replacing old Soviet water piping systems to keep old people warm in the Siberian cold, you could do that. It's not that expensive compared to what Russia is blowing into Ukraine, but Putin has no interest in that. So this happened in January, water pipes burst. Right now the Orsk dam broke, it's, it's, it's a damn humanitarian catastrophe. I don't have to be a wizard or an oracle to tell you what will happen next winter in Russia. What will happen? The water piping will burst even more because maintenance and the lifespan ending ha is coming up to more and more water systems. The life cycle is just ending. It's just a circle of life. You build something, it will crumble at some point if you don't replace or maintain it. And that's the Soviet heating system right now in Russia, everywhere, all across Russia. There will be a huge humanitarian catastrophe because of just water pipes bursting because it, they are frozen shut because they freeze in, in, in the Russian winter and the outer shells are so rough so they burst and people are in cold and dams are breaking uh, thousands hundreds of thousands of people will be flooded that is Russia for you I'm not even talking about how everything burns every day that is just so repetitive I don't want to bore you with it but if you go to Twitter and search Russia burning oh my god there's enough burning for my whole life I will see it in one day in Russia. What's even funnier or, or ironical is that this is the refinery bingo in Russia. Everything you see aflame is a refinery that Ukrainian drones have set ablaze, taken millions and then billions of USD per year away from the Russian budget. But here you don't even need drones because Russia doesn't really maintain their infrastructure and thanks to that one of the refineries has actually drowned. Yes, the Orsk refinery is one of the more modern refineries refineries in Russia and they sold diesel products into the EU also before the sanctions. They are now underwater and if you know refineries, a lot of electrical uh, wiring, a lot of piping, everything that is afraid of water and that is extremely slow to fix and replace is now underwater and broken, water damage all across that refinery. It has suspended all activity and the workers are not getting paid anymore. Just uh, one day your refiner, your workplace is underwater and you're not getting any money anymore. Welcome to Russia, my friend. I think that not maintaining Russian infrastructure is doing even more damage to Russia in the future than the Ukrainian drones could. Because infrastructure failing, oh, it's like a domino effect. A dam goes, suddenly you get a destroyed refinery and 190,000 people underwater. Piping goes, suddenly you get 15 different cities without hot water in the Siberian cold of minus 30 Celsius. And I'm not even talking about the fires because of old electrical infrastructure. From the Soviets, 60s electrical, like these closets that spark all over the place. Seem like a small thing. Oh, it sparks a little bit. Russia is a big country. Multiply that by a thousand Russian cities and that will happen next year, next winter in Russia. My friends, in this video you see the first ever Black Hawk helicopters, two of them flying over Russian soil in the Ukrainian liberated village of Kozinka, which is under Russian Federation geographically, but Ukrainian troops are in, it, are in it. Two Black Hawk choppers landed, the Ukrainian troops landed, ran to their positions and the Black Hawks flew back. It's the first time the Black Hawks are flying over Russian skies at the time of war. A proud moment for us all. My friends, and now I'll bring you the Finnish NAFO fella, Joni Askola, and he gives us a, a, an excellent OSINT analysis point about sanctions. Oh, you want to go to sleep? Sanctions are boring. I understand. Let me just explain a little bit because people are so damn bored with sanctions. Everybody talking about them and they don't explode. I want to see explosions where sanctions are an uh, explosion in slow motion. It's a very boring explosion but it's the deadliest one. 
I'll read you the report. Russian propaganda has effectively led us to believe that sanctions are ineffective and inflict more harm on the West than on Russia. However, this is far from true. Sanctions are not flawless and Russia is indeed discovering ways to bypass them in certain areas. Nevertheless, they notably undermine Russia's strength and lead to a high level of dependence on China. So sanctions have pushed Russia into China's bosom, let's call it like that, and China is slowly buying Russia. It sounds utopian, but they actually are, thereby reducing its sovereignty. First of all, if the sanctions were ineffective, Russia would not denounce them, employ its European proxies to impede and undermine them, and simultaneously advocate for their removal. The fact that Russians are so hard working against the sanctions shows that they know how much they get hurt by them. Russia has faced sanctions since its unlawful occupation of Crimea in 2014. Russia's nominal GDP in 2013, so one year before the occupation of Crimea, before the imposition, before the imposition of these sanctions was high higher than Russian current GDP, which means that Russia was a bigger economy 10 years ago than now. This serves as a compelling evidence that the sanctions are indeed having an impact. And sanctions are, I will say it as it is, it's a, it's a boring, slow weapon, but it's damn effective. 10 years ago, Russian economy was bigger than now. And sanctions started 10 years ago. Sanctions don't do nothing with two, three, maybe even five years. But if you add a decade, it adds up. It's like a compounding interest on an S&P 500. If you stick to it for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, that will pummel the other country's economy to the ground to the dust. That is what is going to happen with Russia in the next decade. The prices in Russia have surged as a result of sanctions. Sanctioned goods will inevitably experience increased cost. Notably, Russia's year-on-year -year inflation rate on February hit a one-year peak of 7.7%, despite a 16% interest rate. Now, a 16% interest rate is so high that your inflation is, should be, what, 2%, 1% or 0 but if with the 16% interest, the inflation was still 77 I don't know much about economy, very limited knowledge about economy, but as much as I know, this is, this is messed up. At the end of 2023, the Russian Ministry of Finance had utilized four out of nine trillion rubles, nearly half of the liquid portion of the National Wealth Fund. The liquid portion here is important. important. Designated as the Central Reserve for Unforeseen Circumstances. Now, unforeseen is a bad word for this because this is definitely foreseen. Every knowledgeable Western analyst who knows anything about economy could see this coming because this is how economies work. I mean, we live in a capitalist system which was invented in the West and Russia, of course, copied it. We're all capitalists in the world. Even China, they're making money from the West, which is capitalist. So we know how this stuff works. Our economists know how it works and they know how to hurt this system. Sanctions are the most boring and the most effective weapon to hurt a globally connected economy, which Russia is or was at least now they're not. They're very slowly in a death world, death down spiral. It takes time. If you want results now, don't buy S&P 500. But there's a reason everybody praises it who has patience. It is like the sanctions. Now, my friends, for the first time of this week, we survived the Monday and I'm going to not survive these Buy Me A Coffee members' names. And if you like my channel, you can become a member and I'll be butchering your name to oblivion. Goretk Mitkel Someone. I think I finally figured out who Someone is. I think this is a name that if, if somebody doesn't write their name, it just puts Someone because we have so many Someones. I don't think everybody's name is Someone. It just fills it automatically if you don't put anything. Rus. Rusge. Mi Bik. Christ. Cox. Fur. R. V. Les Caras, Urban Archar, Nicolas Barbier. Thank you to these members of Buy Me A Coffee. Link is in the description below. Also, my friends, let's get the Combine Our Birthday Party fundraiser to 120,000. And I'll be making very cool videos about it to you, how we deliver, procure, drive to Ukraine, drive to Kiev, give it to the units. Estonian-made NATO standard drones. They're fighting against Chinese DJI, which is really bad in Ukraine. We don't want to do that no more. Go and donate, my friends, and until my next video, which is tomorrow, subscribe.
Press the bell notification. Slava Ukraini. And bye-bye.